a central idea and also in the narrative reality within Ursula K. Le Guin's sixth Earthsea novel, The Other Wind, is what is referred to in Kargish as the Verduran, and in the old speech, the true speech, the Vernadan. Uh, both of these signify the same thing, and we're going to see allusions to it early on, and then it really only gets explored and explained in the fifth chapter. What it means is some sort of agreement, but also a division between different peoples, and it's made, but it's also broken, and it's part of the history of Earthsea as it's being revealed to us in this, this final novel, this final narrative that Le Guin has uh, things being uncovered and compared and, and finally figured out and resolved. Um, but it's also something that is pressing for the characters then. So it's part of their history. It's also part of their destiny, you might say, and the choices that they have to make. So the early references to it, the first reference is actually in the mouth of the Kargish princess talking to Tenar, Sesarach. And what, what Sesarach says is um, they're talking about dragons and being reborn and all of that, that sort of thing. And she says, um, the story is about the accursed sorcerers discovering the Verdurnan. That was a thing. I don't know what it was that told some people that if they'd agree never to die and never to be reborn, they could learn how to do sorcery. So they chose that. They chose the Verdurnan and um, they went off into the West with it and it turned them dark and they live here. All these people here, they're the ones who chose it. They live and they can do their accursed sorceries, but they can't die. Only their bodies die. The rest of them stays in a dark place and never gets reborn. And they look like birds, but they can't fly. So this is the Kargish point of view on this. And this is going to turn out to be a misrepresentation, a bit of a distortion, but it also contains a deep truth to it. And this recalls uh, to Tenor's mind the story of the woman of Kamei. In the beginning of time, mankind and the dragons had been one. But the dragons chose wildness and freedom and mankind chose wealth and power, a choice, a separation. Was it the same story? And then um, Sesarach says, it's not that ring, is it, that they kept talking about that I'm going to have to wear? And she says, ring? No, no, that's not the ring. Uh, it's, it's something completely different. And they get onto a different track talking about names and sorcery and stuff like that. Then a little bit later, we find the term coming up again, but now in the old speech. This is Seppel talking, the Pelnish wizard. And the Pelnish you know, are viewed with kind of suspicion by the wizards and mages of Roak, in part because of the Pelnish lore, which has to do with you know, the, the dead and overcoming death. And um, they're talking about immortality, and you know what the dead actually want. Alder says they want to be free. And then Seppel says, maybe it was a bad bargain from the beginning. Verunadan. Alder knew the words were in the old speech, but he did not know their meaning. And so now we see this coming up again, right? And these are the same word, one in Kargish and one in um, the old speech, right? And nobody actually says anything about it in Hardik. So those are the first things. And then much later, Tenor says, okay, you need to tell Labanan, your you know, husband-to-be, uh, and the, the king, the account that you have. And so Sesarak actually goes into this and says, Long ago, Karg people, sorcery people, dragon people, ha, yes, all people all speak one, one language. 
in her passionate attempt to speak Hardik, she was losing her self-consciousness. But then dragon people say, let go, let go, all things fly. But we people, we say, no, keep, keep all things dwell. So we go apart, dragon people and we people. So they make the Verdunan. These to let go, these to keep. Yes, but to keep all things, we must let go that language, the dragon people language. The old speech, Labanan says, yes, so we people, we let go that old speech language and keep all things. And dragon people let go all things, but keep that, keep the language. This is the Verdunan. We go east, east, east. Dragon people go west, west, west. We dwell, they fly. Some dragon come east with us, but not keep the language. Forget and forget to fly, like Karg people. Karg people speak Karg language, not dragon language. All keep the Verdunan, east, west. Sanaya, but in, at a law, she brought her hands together from east and west, and Labanan said, in the middle? Ha, yes, in the middle. In the middle, you, sorcery people, you middle people speak Hardic language, but too, also keep to speak old speech language. You learn it like I learn Hardic, learn to speak. Then this, this is the bad, the bad thing. You say in that sorcery language, in that old speech language, we will not to die. And it is so, and the Verdunan is broken. So the agreement, the splitting apart of dragonkind and humankind is honored by the Kargs, but not by the mass of the archipelagans in Earthsea, at least some of whom, actually many of whom, learn the, the old speech and learn to use magic, which is not entirely of the old speech. After all, there are the old powers of the earth and there are other things that, that you know, function in magic, but names in the old speech is really central. So learning the old speech is a breaking of this agreement. Instead of everybody going to their separate corners and, and being okay with that, there's this intermixing, this sort of familial, everybody being up in each other's business. Later, Osver, the uh, mage, the patterner is going to, the, the namer is going to tell, no, the patterner is going to tell another account of this. Now, he's also a karg, so you have to keep that in mind. And he goes on. And he tells an account in which there is yet another version of the, um, the story that goes on. And he, uh, he tells them that when he was a boy, he learned, uh, here we go. The human beings went east, the dragons west. The humans gave up their knowledge of the language of the making and in exchange received all skill and craft of hand and ownership of all that hands can make. The dragons let go such things. They kept the old speech and their wings. And their wings, Labanan said. He had caught Osra's eyes. Patterner, perhaps you can continue the story better than I. And then Osra says something really interesting. The villagers at Gaunt and her at her Remember what the wise men of Roke and the priests of Carrego forget. Yes, as a, as a child, I was told this tale, I think, or something like it. But the dragons had been forgotten in it. It told how the dark folk of the archipelago broke their oath. Their oath to who then? Not to the dragons, to the Kargish people. At one time, human, human beings were all one people, and the Kargs kept the agreement, and the archipelagans broke it. We had all promised to forego sorcery in the language of sorcery, speaking only our common tongue. We would name no names, make no spells. We would trust to Segoy, to the powers of the earth, our mother, mother of the warrior gods. But the dark folk broke the covenant. They caught the language of the making in their craft, writing it in runes. They kept it, taught it, used it. They made spells with it, with the skill of their hands, with false tongues speaking true words. So the Kargish people can never trust them, so says the tale. So now we have two different stories about what's going on. One is humans and dragons, which maps on to the story about um, human beings and dragons told by the woman of Kamei. Osra has this child story, but then he tells another story, another account. He says that, I will give you, I will say um, what I have half learned, half guessed, not from village tales, 
but from the most ancient records in the Isolate Tower. A thousand years before the first kings of Enlad, there were men in Ea and Solea, the first and greatest of the mages, the rune makers. It was they who learned to write the language of the making. They made the runes which the dragons never learned. And they taught us to give each soul, each human soul, each person, its true name, which is its truth itself. And with their power, they granted to those who bear their true name beyond the body's death. Now we're getting to something different here. It's no longer just being able to do sorcery and you know, not leaving the dragon's language behind or the original language behind. Now it's about life and death. Life immortal, Seppel's soft voice took the word. He spoke smiling a little. In a great land of rivers and mountains and beautiful cities where there's no suffering or pain, where the self endures unchanged, unchanging forever, that is the dream of the ancient lore of Palm. So some magic users, those using the Pelnish lore or the lore of Palm based in that island, based in that tradition, we're trying to you know, get people to be able to live forever in a land that would be wonderful, um, unchanging, not like the world we live in. Here's where it starts to get really interesting. Where, the summoner said, where is that land? And now Irian, the dragon, says, it's on the other wind, you dummies. This is part of why we're upset with you, we dragons, right? The West beyond the West. Now, in the story of the woman of Kamei, the West beyond the West is where the other people went who were, you know, sort of both human and dragon, right? And what do we find out? She says, do you think our freedom is no greater than that of the mindless seagulls? You earn the only earth, you own the sea. We are the fire of sunlight. We fly the wind. You wanted land to own. You wanted things to make and keep, and you have that. That was the division, the Veronadon. So she's telling us what the Veronadon was. But you were not content with your share. You wanted not only your cares, but our freedom. You wanted the wind. And by the spells and wizardries of those oath breakers, who are the oath breakers? These original mages, you stole half our realm from us, walled it away from life and light, so you could live there forever. So the dragons had their portion, and the human beings took half of that portion, half of that land of immortality. Azra says after that, the ancients saw the dragon's realm was not of the body only. They could fly outside of time, it may be. And envying that freedom, they followed the dragon's way into the west beyond the west. They claimed part of that realm as their own, a timeless realm where the self might be forever, but not in the body as the dragons were. Only in spirit could men be there. So they made a wall which no living body could cross, neither man nor dragon. And their arts of naming laid a great net of spells on all the western lands. So when the people of the islands die, they would come to the west beyond the west and live there in the spirit forever. So this is what the Pelnish lore was talking about. This is what those original mages did. They created the walls of stones. But doing that created the dry land. And as the story goes on... Um, as the wall was built and the spell laid, the wind ceased to blow within the wall. The sea withdrew. The spring ceased to run. The mountains of sunrise became the mountains of the night. Those who died came to a dark land, a dry land. So the, the dark land, the dry land, the two really important things we're learning. It was a human creation out of the raw material of the world and the place west beyond the west, the other wind, but it also went awry. It turned into something that it wasn't supposed to be. And so the dragons were angry because some of their, their land was stolen and nobody wants to go to the dry land and it becomes sort of a, you know, a terrible place that is only a mockery of immortality. Then we have Cobb and Thorian stirring stuff up, you know, trying to break the boundary between living and dead. And this makes the dead restless, but also 
makes the dragons remember that the human beings had broken this agreement with them. And so, you know, now the question is, what will they do? How will they address this? Interestingly, the person who has, you might say, the last word on this is the doorkeeper, right? The master doorkeeper, he says, I think maybe the division that was begun and then betrayed will be completed at last. The dragons will go free and leave us here to the choice we made. The knowledge of good and evil, said Onyx. The joy of making shaping, says Seppel, our mastery. And our greed, our weakness, our fear, says Osver. And so there's the possibility that things can be indeed fixed, that this agreement... Now, now broken, can be, in some respect, restored. But that will be a complete division. 